This video is about limits of functions of a complex variable. Before we talk about functions of a complex variable though, let's review some calc one. Let's talk about functions of a real variable. So let's let A be a subset of the real line. Let's let F be a function whose domain is A and whose you know, codomain is the real numbers. So it's not complex valued, it's real valued. And uh, let's say that uh, A is just some real number in the domain of our function. So recall this notation, this lim x arrow a f of x, what does that stand for? And so of course we know that's the limit as x approaches a of f of x, and it stands for the following idea. What do the outputs of f tend to as x tends to a? And there are three possibilities that could happen as far as we want to answer that question. So let me zoom in over here on the green. So the first thing that could happen is, well, you could get a real number. That's what the outputs might tend to. And in that case is when we'd say that the limit actually exists. The second thing that can happen is that the outputs tend to infinity or to negative infinity. And the third thing that can happen is we'd say that the outputs don't tend to anything. So the limit does not exist. So those are the only three possibilities for uh, a limit uh, of a real valued function. Just reminding you of that. And what else is kind of funny along the real line? Or not funny, actually nice. Along the real line, there are only two ways for my inputs x to actually approach this particular input a that I care about. So the first way that we could approach a is from the left. And if you allow me to zoom in a little bit, I've drawn my number line and there's a. And what's from the left mean? Literally think about x values that are to the left of a. So think about what's going on with my function as the inputs x tend to a from the left. And the other possibility is that the inputs tend to a from the right. So literally considering just inputs that are to the right of a. And with this idea, we're, we are able to define one-sided limits. So the first one-sided limit we see here, and all that's different, I've tried to draw your attention to a little minus sign up in the exponent on a, that just stands for, this is the limit of my function as x approaches a from the left. So the little minus sign just says you're coming from the left. So you're only looking at x values to the left of a. And then similarly here, the little plus sign tells you that you're considering the limit as x approaches a from the right. You're only looking at x values uh, to the right of a. And then what are your outputs doing after that? And then we, in Calculus 1, we said that there's a relationship between what is the limit. When I say the limit, I mean up here, where I don't have some plus or a minus up here in the exponent on a. So up here, let me zoom in a little bit. That's what I'll refer to as the limit. So what's the relationship between that notation and these two notations, these two one-sided limits? And of course, the relationship is the following. The limit as x approaches a of f of x exists if and only if both the one-sided limits exist and those one-sided limits have to match. They have to give you the same real number. Now let me give you an example. So that's a characterization again of what does it mean for a limit to exist. Let me give you an example that demonstrates this. So I've got this step function here, and in red, obviously, that's the function f. And if I think about what's going on as my inputs approach 1 from the right, well, as you approach 1 from the, right, from the right, all the y values are 2. And so I see that the limit as x approaches 1 from the right is 2. Whereas if you look at the other step, I'm thinking about the limit as x approaches 1 from the left, I see all those y values are 1. And so what we just determined is the one-sided limits do not match. From the left, you get 1, whereas from the right, you get 2. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 1 does not exist. Now that we've reviewed limits as far as uh, functions of a real variable are concerned, now let's turn to the new thing. What do we do for limits of a function of a complex variable? So let's let g be some subset of the complex plane. Let's let f be a function whose domain is g now. And let's let w be some input in g, so somebody from the domain of our function. And uh, just for as far as the picture is concerned, there's a picture of what a g might look like, some squiggly thing that I like to draw. And w is inside of there. And I want to know, how should I make sense of the limit as z approaches w of f of z? And I still want it to represent the same thing that it did in calculus 1 with real value functions. I still want it to represent what do the outputs of f tend to as z tends to w. But let's talk about what's different now. And let me scroll down a little bit. So there are, what's different now is that there are many ways that z's could approach my w. So it's not just from the left or from the right. And just to, to try to emphasize that, maybe my z's approach w along this squiggly path inside the domain. Or maybe they approach w along that squiggly path or along that squiggly path. So I'm trying to suggest to you that there's no, there's no way to exhaust all possible directions from which I could approach w. There's too many ways. There's infinitely many ways. There's uncountably many ways. My goodness. 
So how, how should we define this notation, the limit as z approaches w of f of z in such a way that this value uh, still gives me, you know, what, what do the outputs tend to as z approaches w, no matter what direction I approach from. And so let's look at an example. So let's look at this kind of uh, goofy complex value function. So I'm looking at the limit as z approaches 0 plus 0i of the imaginary part of z squared divided by z times its modulus plus the imaginary part of z, but just that squared. So that's a real number squared. Okay, so if I just look maybe along the x-axis, let's let the z values approach the origin along the x-axis. Of course, that means that y is zero. In other words, the imaginary part would be zero. And it would be a good exercise for you to actually take this function, imaginary part of z squared divided by blah, 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 and put it in terms of x plus i y's and do that foiling and see what the actual formula is that you get. And then I'm telling you to plug in zero for all the y's. And if you do that, you should come to that this reduces to the limit of zero over x squared plus zero squared. Of course, as x plus zero i approaches zero plus zero i. And the point there, right, is that x is approaching zero, but it's not quite zero yet. And so this is just zero divided by some number x, which of course is zero. So along the x-axis, this limit is zero. Let's just check the other axis. So what happens if z tends to zero plus zero i along the y-axis? And again, just an exercise, then I know that z looks like zero plus y i. In other words, if you're on the imaginary axis, then your real part is zero. And again, if you plug that into the function, plug in zero for all the x's and start simplifying some things, you'd see that the numerator is zero, and in the bottom you should get y squared plus y squared. And of course, that's zero divided by some number, which is zero. Maybe I should be more careful. Zero divided by some non-zero number, right? Because we're not letting y quite get to zero. We're just saying y gets close to zero. Anyway, zero. So what does x suggest? Well, along both the axes, you get the same thing, zero. And sometimes students think that's pretty powerful. But that doesn't actually suggest that the actual limit is going to be zero. So just checking the axis doesn't somehow magically exhaust all possible directions that we could approach zero plus zero i from. And like you saw in my picture, you know, maybe you have to go along like some squiggly path. How do I rule that out, that the limit's not different? And so in fact, there, because there are many ways to approach zero plus zero i, it's an impossible task to try to do this by exhausting all directions. And in fact, if you, there's actually a direction, if I go along the line y equals x, then z looks like x plus ix, or if you like, y plus iy, doesn't matter. And if you substitute that in, you should get, this is the limit of blah, 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 over 2x squared over 3x squared, which of course is 2 thirds. So I get something that's not zero. So it doesn't match those other two directions. So what am I suggesting to you here? The point here is that trying to define a limit via directions, it's not a good way to go. You can't exhaust all possible directions that we approach our w from. And so what we need then is for a definition, we need a definition that has the concept baked in. And what I've done so far when I've tried to re remind you of how limits work is, you know, I've, I've avoided like a very formal definition of a limit and tried to approach this from kind of a calculus one perspective of what do I want it to do? What do I want it to like represent? Um, and so what we're going to do now is actually define it that has this direction business baked in so that I don't have to spend time checking all these directions and worrying about is there a direction I didn't think about that would give me a different number than this direction, etc. So how do I do that? And the answer is thank goodness for topology. So you actually saw this if you took, if you maybe read your calculus book a little bit more deeply, or maybe if you took a real analysis class, you've probably seen the epsilon delta definition of what does it mean to say that the number L is the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And here, of course, I'm assuming that l is a real number. So what does that mean again? So that means that given a real positive number epsilon, that there exists a real positive number delta. And so notice here, epsilon's arbitrary, but once you have an epsilon, then there's some delta that's related to it that maybe depends on it somehow. And there's some real number delta such that if the absolute value of x minus a is between zero and delta, and now what does that say? That means that x and a are within delta of each other, and the little zero on the left, that just means I'm not allowing x to actually be equal to a. And so if x is sufficiently close to a, then that tells me that f of x minus l is less than epsilon. In other words, the output of f is sufficiently close to l. Let me give you a little picture that tries to demonstrate again what the game is here. So here's a little schematic where I've got the domain of the function on the left side, and I've got you know codomain of the function on the right side. And uh, I'm not saying L is in the range, I'm just saying it's in the codomain. But how does this work? So what does this definition say? 
This says that no matter how small of a window you put around L, so a window or an interval, if you like, of length epsilon, if I put that interval around L, then I should be able to go back to the domain and find an interval to put around A of radius delta. So once you've got epsilon again, then you should be able to go back and find a delta such that if you were to pick an x inside of that interval, then I'm guaranteed that its output is inside of the red interval. So you might rewind that video just to watch that one more time how that works and just the things to notice. For any epsilon, for any red window you put around there, you should be able to find some blue window so that all the inputs in the blue window have outputs in the red window. So what are some things to notice? I know that absolute value measures the distance between two real numbers. And this notation, it looks scary, but all this is, is it's a disk or it's a ball if you like. In my case, it's one dimensional, so it's an interval that it's centered at A of radius delta. And again, the zero on the left side just says we're not allowed to be A. Some people might call that like a punctured interval or a punctured ball or a punctured neighborhood. That punctured word says that you don't want the center. And then similarly here, this, is just a disc or a ball centered at L of radius epsilon. So we wanna be able to turn these kind of you know, set notation expressions into something we can visualize perhaps. And uh, all right, well I know how absolute value of real numbers work and I've used this notation or this, this uh, vocabulary, sorry, disc and ball that we've seen before in the other complex videos. We're gonna try and generalize that now. So if I take a domain G of the complex plane, or maybe I should just say some subset of the complex plane, and let's say W is in there, and let's say F is a function whose domain is G, and let's let L be some complex number. So what should L being the limit of Z as approaches W of F of Z, like what should that mean? What should the definition actually be? That's again, as far as we're writing this down, I don't have to check a bunch of directions. So what does it mean to say that? That means that we'll give an epsilon, there exists some number delta such that, some real number delta, right? Such that, again, if the modulus of z minus w is between zero and delta, in other words, absolute value of z minus w now, remember that still measures how far apart z and w actually are from each other in the complex plane, right? That's just the distance between those two points. So if z and w are sufficiently close to each other, then f of z and l are sufficiently close to each other. Or in other words, they're within that little epsilon ball around l. And let's do the same kind of thing where that's the definition that you're going to play with in some proofs, but let's actually look at one more time. What's that say? So here's the setup. You've got your domain G and W some point in there, and then F takes me over into another copy of the complex plane, and you've got L. And again, I'm not saying L is in the range of F. I'm just saying it's in the codomain somewhere. So what's this definition mean? What's it mean to say that the limit of F uh, as you approach W gives you L? So that means, again, epsilon's arbitrary. I should be able to plop any little disk around L that I like, of any radius that I like, any radius epsilon that I like. And once I've done that, to say that this limit exists, that means that I should be able to go back to look around W, and I should be able to find some window around W, some radius delta, such that if I was to pick any other complex number inside of that window, inside of that disk around W, then I'm guaranteed that its output F of Z is inside of the window around L. So again, you might re-watch that, rewind that and re-watch it and just be very careful to the fact that you start with epsilon and you should be able to find a corresponding delta that makes this stuff work out. So let's look at an example in this case about uh, how does a proof go with this where we use the epsilon delta definition. Maybe it's been a while since you've done that or maybe you've never done that. So I wanna prove that the limit of Z approaches I of one plus two z is equal to one plus two i. And I've gone ahead and I've labeled here, f of z is one plus two z, that's my function, and I'm considering l to be the complex number one plus two i. What I like to do for these when you're asked to prove something like epsilon delta proof stuff is some scratch work ahead of time. So I know that I want f of z minus l to be less than epsilon there. So I've just written that out. And typically what you do is you start there and you start playing around with it. And you start playing around with it in such a way that uh, I wanna get some kind of an expression that involves the absolute value of z minus i. Remember that measures how close z and i are to each other. And that's important here because that's what your inputs are approaching. That, that's telling you information about your inputs. So of course, what could I do? I could combine some like terms in there. And so if you combine some like terms inside, you get 2z minus 2i is uh, less than epsilon, or sorry, it's modulus is less than epsilon. And of course, you could divide everything by two. And when I do that, the reason I would divide everything by two is because I know that that'll get my absolute value of z minus i into the picture. And that's important because that's the limit that I care about. That's what my inputs, uh, my inputs are approaching i. 
So it looks like the modulus of z minus i should be less than epsilon over 2. So what that tells me is to go ahead and just take delta equal to epsilon over 2. And what we're going to do in the proof is really just run our scratch work a little bit backwards. So here's our proof. How's it go? Let epsilon be bigger than 0. So that's how you should always start any epsilon delta proof. That tells you that epsilon is arbitrary. You're not picking it in any special way. What I'm about to do is going to work for any epsilon. And I'm going to choose now a delta such that it's uh, epsilon over 2. And really, any number smaller than epsilon over 2 would work as well. So if z is a complex number such that the absolute value of z minus i is between 0 and epsilon over 2, so in other words, the numbers z and i are within epsilon over 2 of each other, and I'm not allowing z to actually be i, then when I consider the difference of 1 plus 2z and uh, 1 plus 2i, when I consider how far apart those two numbers are, I'm going to do my algebra, and I get 2z minus 2i. I'm going to factor that 2 out there, and then now, what have I assumed? I have assumed that the absolute value of z minus i, it's no bigger than epsilon over 2. So this expression should be less than 2 times epsilon over 2. And again, our scratch work, the whole point of that was to make this kind of pretty. I picked a delta so that uh, at the very end, I get f of z minus l is uh, less than epsilon.